The Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of the soul and the spirit of the joints and the marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. The Bible tells us to be diligent, to present yourself approved unto God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. And as always, we assemble together to fulfill the royal imperative of 2 Peter 3.18, to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, as you know, we've been studying some things about the devil, his tools, and his tactics, understanding all of his ways that he can be identified, all the names that he has according to the scriptures, and all the things that he does to believers, against believers, and he does this because in modern terminology, he's a hater. He hates both God and men. Well, before we move on to our study, we want to uh, take a few moments. I found something that's interesting, and it's uh, related to a small segment of our study, and it has to do with uh, some things in the past and some things that are present day and becoming more and more prevalent as we move towards the future. <clears throat> now, uh, we talk about uh, things that are going on in the world today, and, and of course, uh, one of the hot topics, if you will, is artificial intelligence. And uh, they've begun to use artificial intelligence to piece together fragments of ancient texts. There's an article in Jerusalem Post about this this month, and uh, it tells us a team led by Professor Enrique Iglesias, no, I'm just kidding, Enrique Jimenez, who uh, constructed an unprecedented database called the Fragmentarium, which uses automation to piece together text fragments. A uh, researcher at uh, Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich, Germany, is uh, using artificial intelligence to fill in gaps in ancient texts. And there's thousands of them, thousands of recovered texts, uh, all the way back from the earliest texts in uh, Sumerian times with Akkadian language. That's what you're looking at right here, is an Akkadian fragment, Tablet 2 they call it, and it's a poem that's called the Epic of Gilgamesh, and from the uh, times uh, that these uh, poems were written, uh, went from 2003 to 1595 BC. And of course, uh, a lot of them are housed in uh, Iraq, and of course the majority of them are well, they were stolen by the British, and they're in the British Museum. However, uh, you can also find out more information about this at uh, a website called phys.org. That's P-H-Y-S dot org. Uh, professor Jimenez, uh, he's a professor of ancient Near East literature in the Institute of Seriology, has led a team that is digitizing every surviving Babylonian cuneiform tablet. They've been working on this since 2018, and uh, since then they've processed 22,000 fragments of ancient texts. And this is uh, specializing in these uh, Akkadian and uh, Babylonian cuneiform tablets and texts. Uh, some of these things, of course, you know, they've, they find these on uh, steles, is what they call them, uh, stone-faced monuments, if you will, in different parts of the world. But uh, <clears throat> uh, anyway, the team constructed an unprecedented database called the Fragmentarium that uses automation to piece together text fragments. Thousands of fragments were photographed by the team in cooperation with the Iraq Museum and the British Museum. 
The team that built the database believes it will eventually have the capability to identify and transcribe photographs of cuneiform scripts. The researchers are training an algorithm to put together pieces of text that are out of context. It has so far successfully pieced together hundreds of manuscripts. And of course, this is another one. This is a, uh, another tablet that uh, is part of the Epic of Gilgamesh. They call it the Deluge Tablet. Uh, the uh, algorithm that they're creating has identified a fragment uh, from 130 BC belonging to a tablet of the Epic of Gilgamesh last November. So there's outside of the uh, Akkadian text that they have, uh, back earlier they found another one, and one they dated as 130 BC, and uh, notably the tablet is uh, thousands of years newer than the older version of the Epic of Gilgamesh. There are thousands of fragments that have not yet been identified. And of course, uh, you know, some of these things may be eventually uh, reconciled through uh, certain dating processes that are accurate. Uh, I know that I've studied uh, a lot of different kinds of uh, dating processes, carbon dating, radiometric dating, dendrochronology, that's uh, tree ring dating, and uh, well, not all of it is, is as accurate as you might think. However, they, st they still go on and uh, use some of these things to try and and uh, date things that they find from the past. And that's uh, basically the best science that they have so far at the time. <clears throat> uh, the new texts uh, were, discovering, uh, were, dis were discovered uh, help researchers to understand the literature and culture of the region. There are plans to publish the fragmentarium along with a digital version of the Epic of Gilgamesh. Uh, the first containing all transcriptions of cuneiform fragments that are currently known this month. So there's going to be more information coming out about this. And uh, they, they have hopes to put something like this online where uh, people are, will be able to go in and, and look at the texts and, and see how they've been reconciled and, and uh, offer opinions and uh, possibly uh, even some more findings. So that's something that's kind of interesting. And of course, when we uh, think about uh, artificial intelligence, I know uh, some time back, uh, whenever we were <coughs> at the uh, hotel on Meridian and also over on MacArthur, I mentioned to you uh, a, a movie. It's a documentary film, and it's called The Social Dilemma. I don't know if you ever got to take a look at that or not. But uh, what it is, it's a documentary about how they write algorithms and uh, they put these into the social networks and they, they're hidden, if you will, in the social networks in certain data and certain websites and things like this. And they're designed to make people participate in their social network. They may uh, send a contact to somebody the artificial intelligence will do this, send a contact to somebody, even though that person has not contacted them. But they know that they've had contact before. You know, so-and-so wants to be your friend. And then they go ahead and respond or they don't. But you see, it's something like this. Uh, you know, this is a simple one, but there are actually uh, quite a bit more to it. But if you ever have the opportunity, uh, check out the social dilemma, and uh, you may be surprised at what you hear. I think by now, with all the things that have gone on and, and uh, things that have been found out about some of these uh, websites, that you know, if you use them, you want to use them with caution because uh, you could get in a, a quite a bind, just to simply put it, quite a bind with some of the things that are going on. <clears throat> and of course, uh, it's uh, one of the great distractions of today's world, the social network, cell phones, on and on and on.
Hopefully you picked up uh, the notes this morning, beginning at page 6, The Devil, His Identity, Tactics, and Tools, Part 2. And of course, uh, what we're going to be looking at is our phase 2 evaluation, mental uh, attitude, and righteous practical applications. Now if we uh, refer to the scriptures, talking about these uh, subjects, if you will, looking to Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 5, and that's what we're here to learn is uh, things from the scriptures, the word of God specifically, and uh, how we deal with things, how God expects us and directs us to deal with things as we pursue the Christian way of life. And here's some uh, good information. Evil men do not understand justice, but those who seek the Lord understand all things. Now, that's one of the things that you have to deal with. I can remember years ago, when uh, my son worked at a uh, stereo and window tent store, and uh, I won't tell you the name, but the initials are, uh, no, uh, FX, uh, but uh, anyway, uh, he was working there, and there was a time that a guy come in driving a pickup, and he wanted this, uh, you know, high fidelity stereo installed in his pickup, and they he wanted a big woofer box behind the seat, so they pulled the seat out to put the woofer in there, and they found some funny looking stuff in there. Well, at that particular time, right next door, there was uh, the window tent part of the facility. They were uh, putting what they call bulletproof tinting on police cars and doing some other things for the local police, which just happened to be right across the street. Well, they didn't know what it was. They told the boss, and the boss went next door got a police officer, he come over there and he said, well that's stuff they use to make meth. And that's quite a bit of it. And they said this was just all laying under the seat? Said, yeah. Well long story short, after they, he told them just go ahead and put the stereo in and leave the rest to them. And uh, anyway, they, they followed him uh, a safe distance to the outer skirts of the city there and uh, pulled him over and busted him. And uh, then later on, we got a call from the, from the uh, state attorney's office. And they were prosecuting this guy. And uh, they wanted to know if, uh, since at that time my son was a minor, if uh, I would be willing to let him come and testify. And I said, well, I said, I think that would probably be okay. And he said, well, it's done then. We'll do I said, now hold on. I said, uh, what kind of protection do you offer? I said, we know nothing about this guy. Can you tell me something about him? Well, he's really, he's kind of a, a middleman, and he's involved in this ring, and we want to get to the bigger guys. But we really need to have your son come and testify. Well, and I said, well, why don't you just let me think about this? Well, about a week later, he calls back, and he said, well, he said, uh, uh, we've uh, talked to this guy, and uh, your son's not going to have to testify because we did a plea bargain, and he's going to give us the bigger fish, you see. And, of course, uh, you know, I look at these things, and I, I say, well, if I was district attorney, I'd prosecute who I've got right in front of me. Get all the information I can out of them, I'm going to prosecute them anyway. I'm not uh, real big about the plea bargain thing. And I understand that, uh, you know, uh, a lot of times uh, law enforcement is seeking a way to get to the bigger fish, but it doesn't always happen as smooth as uh, everybody would think that. You know, and, and when we talk about justice, well, we know that people in those positions, they understand man's justice. When we talk about God's word, we're talking about God's justice based on his righteousness. And we know that if we seek the Lord, according to the scriptures here, we can understand all things. All things about justice and many other things too as we continue to pursue the Christian way of life. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 2.15. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 In verse 15. Now we've hit on this verse a few times. 
And here Paul tells the Corinthians, he says, But he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. Now, this is one that's uh, sometimes confusing for some people. But uh, the idea is that if you appraise all things accurately and in a good fashion, according to divine viewpoint, there will be no reason for you to be evaluated. And yet, you yourself will be appraised by no one. So these are the things that we have to do as believers. We have to seek the Lord. We have to appraise all things. And of course, it starts with us as individual believers. How's my mental attitude today? Well, it may not be good. Could be bad. But it could be better. So we have to look at these things and not, not try to get distracted and uh, tied up with the circumstances of life. Uh, when we do evaluation like this, you know, we have to ask ourselves some certain questions. Uh, point one, are we making sure that we prioritize and employ our most pressing responsibilities? Or are we distracted by our work, our phase two circumstances, the pursuit of happiness, or the pursuit of the details of life? Those are legitimate questions that we have to look at. The Bible addresses all these things. So we have to do this. This would be something that we should ask ourselves on a regular basis. Point two, we should put ourselves to the test on a regular basis. Do our applications, our behavior, and our character meet or exceed biblical standards? Now, I'm pretty sure that we can safely say that our character probably does not exceed biblical standards because they are very high ethical and moral standards. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 13. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5. And in this letter to the Corinthians, Paul says, Test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test? This is what we have to look at. Now, I think most of us know that the, the Corinthians, uh, they were uh, pretty proud, arrogant people. Uh, they thought they had it all going on, but they they made a few mistakes. You know, there was a guy that, uh, you know, c committed uh, adultery with his stepmother. And uh, Paul told me, you know, you need to throw him out of the church for a while. And then doing what they thought was right, when he finally repented, they wasn't going to let him back in. Well, Paul had to tell him, hey, you don't want this person to suffer from excessive sorrow. Let them back into the church. You know, they've repented. Let them back in. You know, yeah, it's one of these situations. And we know from what we're told uh, in Corinthians that uh, 1 Corinthians was not the first letter that Paul wrote to them. But we do have these two letters, 1 and 2 Corinthians, they're called to tell us about the major issues that took place at Corinth with the believers. So that's one of the things that uh, we have in, in front of us as we have uh, our instruction manual. We have the owner's manual, if you will, for the body that we pilot around the town. The owner's manual tells us how to operate. <clears throat> And, of course, uh, you have to understand, too, that uh, when Paul says test yourselves here, well, guess what? It's a uh, imperative in the Greek language. It's a royal imperative for believers. If we take anything from the scriptures, we have to understand that royal imperatives are a command for us in the church age. Let's look at 2 Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter one verses four through nine. And here Peter says <clears throat> in uh, 
the opening of this uh, section here. <clears throat> Talking about God, he says, For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Lust is the means of corruption in the world. He said, now for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence. And in your moral excellence, knowledge. And in your knowledge, self-control. And in your self-control, perseverance. And in your perseverance, godliness. And in your godliness, brotherly kindness. And in your brotherly kindness, love. And, of course, you all know that word in the Greek, right? Agape, highest form of Christian love. He says, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what we're here to learn, right? Grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In verse 9 he says, For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. You forgot where you came from. That's a dangerous thing in life to forget where you came from. Well, this is what we have to do. We have to do a character check, if you will. And I know a few of you in here are characters, that's for sure. But, uh, you know, it's something that we have to do. We have to check our applications. We have to check our mental attitude. We have to make sure that we're on the right track. And, you know, it's, it's, you get into a, a rhythm, if you will, or a, a daily mode, and you, you know, might think that things are just fine and dandy, you know, until somebody throws you a curveball, so to speak. And then you go to pieces, or you make the wrong application. Yeah. Yeah, that old sin nature is just, you know, laying there, right there. It's not dormant by any means. Not dormant. It's not dead. Uh, you know, oftentimes uh, people refer to it as the old sin nature. Well, that sin nature that's in you is the same age you are. It's your sin nature. You own it. You control it. You see? That's it. Now, genetically, over the years, the, the, that sinful trend that Adam had, you know, was passed on. But guess what? How many ancestors do you have? Shall we go back to Sham, Ham, and Japheth? And see if you can count. Well, I don't think there's anybody who can accurately go back that far and count their ancestors. But what you got is what you were born with, and you have to deal with it. Point three, our NPRs are the filling of the Holy Spirit, prayer, Bible class, righteous practical applications, and worthy conduct. We learn those things. We go back to Ephesians 5.18. I think everybody knows that verse. Probably most of you uh, know it by heart, so to speak. It's stuck in your mind. You understand what it says and what it means. Uh, we've uh, heard this over the years, been taught this, that this is, this is uh, part of the mechanic here about being filled with the Spirit. This is the command to do so. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation. Yeah, get drunk with wine, it's a waste of time. How many of you like to waste time? Well, I don't think anybody does. But every now and then you say, well, you know, I'd just like to kick back and have a few minutes by myself, you know. Or maybe I'll sit down with my wife or my husband or just in my own little room, you know, and, and uh, I'm going to watch this movie, you know, and have a couple glasses of wine. Yeah. No big deal. You think you've earned it? Solomon even says in Ecclesiastes, you know, what you get for your toil, what you produce, what you buy, what you sell, what you eat, and what you drink, that's what you got. That's what man gets for all his toil 
under the sun. Enjoy it. That's all you got. But that's it. You can see here we have a contrast about being filled with wine, which causes drunkenness, or being filled with the Spirit. And this causes us to be in a spiritual state where we can learn things about God's Word and apply what we learn. And the bonus kicker is that we'll lay up treasure in heaven when we're in that spiritual state. Ephesians 6, 18. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 18. And here you remember Paul. It's kind of a, a rally, if you will. He says, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. That's it. We need to be praying for all the saints and be in fellowship when we're doing it as much as possible and be alert. Be alert to what's going on. Yeah. We, we have things that pop up and, you know, if there's uh, something that comes up that uh, we think deserves some attention or a family needs some, uh, some kind of assistance, prayer, or whatever, we'll run it on the bulletin board, you know, or we'll send a text out. Let people know. Somebody needs prayer in this regard or something, whatever the case might be. We want to make sure that we get in those prayers and those practical applications every opportunity that we have. Point A, the application of these priorities keeps us oriented to God's plan. Oriented to God's plan. Let's look at 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. And here, Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, he says, For God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in, with, and by sanctification not only that your Bible doesn't say in with and by but you see that you have to understand that what God does he does by any means in any status in any way that he can that's why I say things like in with and by because God as you know we've studied this uh, just recently is working on our behalf, through Christ and the Holy Spirit, every day, all day long, all year long. But you see, he says, he's not called us for the purpose of impurity. He's called us for another purpose, sanctification. So he rejects, he who rejects this, is not rejecting man, but the God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. That's one of the things that old Saul learned the hard way. You remember Saul in the Old Testament, God told him to do some things. And he said, I'm on it, I'll get it done. And he didn't do it. That's one of the things, you know, when you talk about God at that particular time in history, highest supreme authority in the universe tells this guy who he had ordained as the king of Israel to go and do something. But he doesn't do it. He decides different. See, he didn't, he didn't really understand the principle of authority. And he wanted to do what he thought would please the people. And that's the thing we have to understand. You know, when you're uh, in a position of authority 
and uh, you request something, you hope that people will take care of business and do it. You know, that's one thing about most people that have been in the military, you know, or worked for the government in some way or another. They realize when somebody asks them to do something or commands them to do something. Here it is. This is what they want done. Okay, I'm I'm going to get on it. Yeah, I did that for 30 years, working civil service. I understand what authority is. My dad was in the Air Force for 25 years. He told me what authority was. He said, "I want you to go do this and don't give me any lip." And if you gave him any lip, he'd try and slap it off of you. So, it's one of the things you learn. This is the way it is. But when we deal with God and we don't take care of his words, you know, God has grace. But, you know, if he's got a lesson he wants us to learn, something uh, about sanctification, it's just going to keep going at you and going at you and going at you till you get it. God will do that for you. I know, I've been there. And then all of a sudden one day, oh, 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 hey, okay, I, I got it now. I got it now. It's not that difficult. I want to say, you know, <laughs> Greg, you're a big dummy. You should have figured this out before. But these things, you know, they keep us uh, oriented to God's plan. And if you're not oriented to God's plan, then you may be rejecting God. Point B, if we lack or not apply, or are not applying in uh, any of these areas, we must take solid Bible-based steps to improve. And of course, uh, you know, when we're not making applications, we're out of fellowship. We know 1 John 1, 9 is rebound. That's probably what we should do. We should uh, rebound and, and uh, try and figure some things out. And Paul told the Romans about a few things that uh, they needed to do. Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14, verses 16 through 19. Yeah, and some of this is, you know, it's elementary stuff, but, you know, let's review it and make sure we've got it down. Paul says, therefore, do not let what is for you a good thing be spoken of as evil. He said, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's one of the things, you know, uh, somebody might be giving you a, a tough time about something. It may be eating and drinking. You know, and uh, we have to understand that, uh, you know, we're told by the scriptures not to make anybody stumble. That's an important concept. Don't make your brother stumble. And if somebody speaks of whatever you're into as something that's evil, it doesn't mean that you're supposed to rip them to shreds. But, you know, here's, here's the thing that we need to look at. For the believer, in our phase two, in all things that we do, we should be involved in righteousness and peace and joy in fellowship. It's just that simple, as much as possible, in righteousness, peace, and joy in fellowship. Point C, we must align our priorities by positioning God and his kingdom First, and that's one of the things about uh, what we have in these uh, sections here we're looking at. I've got them highlighted there for you in parentheses, royal imperatives. Let's look at Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. And, of course, there are some people that, you know, they look at this and they say, well, you know, Jesus' ministry is just not technically part of the church age, so I just really don't pay too much attention to what Jesus said. Well, you should. If you uh, feel that way, you should uh, pay attention to the divine viewpoint from the current 
supreme authority of the universe. And here Jesus tells his uh, people, he says, but seek first God's kingdom, his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. All the things that it takes to live your life, God will supply all those for you. It's just that simple. And, of course, it's a royal imperative. Seek first. Seek first. Greek verb zeteo. Greek verb zeteo. Point D, we all have, to, we all have work to do. Uh, it's, you know, some kind of work, whether it's you know, around the house or you know, going somewhere to work or whatever. However, as believers, we must recognize our priorities and concentrate on them and make time, make time or take time to apply. And going to uh, Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, Colossians 3, 1 and 2. Therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ... See, if I called for a hand count, everybody would have to say, okay, well, I've been, I've been raised up with Christ. He says, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Keep seeking, again, form of the verb zeteo. Keep seeking. I wonder what that would be there, huh? A uh, present active indicative? Keep seeking the things above. Set your mind on the things above in verse 2, not on the things that are on earth. He says, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Yeah. It's all about your spiritual status. Who are you? You've died with Christ. Yeah. You've been raised up with Christ. Yeah, set your mind on the right things, the things above. Royal imperative again. E, the Greek verb in these New Testament passages is zeteo, seek, a process motivated by one's own will or volition that involves an investigation or search to find and obtain the thing which one desires. There's your documentation for it. BDAG, Freiburg, TDNT, and Thayer's Greek Lexicon. They all say pretty much the same thing. That's right. When you're seeking something, it's motivated by your will or your volition. This is supposed to be something that, you know, you don't look for something if you don't want to find it, do you? Did anybody in here do that? Uh, no, no? Okay, well. That's something... You know, if we want to find something, we're going to look for it, right? We're going to seek those things above. Well, how do we do that? Those things that are above in the heavenly places, that's our SG3 account up there. You know, we need to maintain our fellowship with God. Maintain our positional status. So that we can continue to advance towards maturity. Point F, if we believe in the hereafter, then we should prioritize and apply as if we know that what we do here will determine what happens in the after. Right? Yeah. Colossians 3, 3 and 4. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. He said, when Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in, with, and by glory. We share in Christ's glory. Why? Because we're heirs. We've been adopted as sons. Yeah. We've been bought with a price. And, of course, uh, <clears throat> point four, are we simplifying or complicating our lives? You might have seen the R and P uh, right there. Uh, you know, we're, we're talking about uh, 
procedures, righteousness and, and procedures there. Point four, are we simplifying or complicating our lives? Are we learning divine viewpoint, eliminating human viewpoint, and sustaining control of our mental attitude? Well, right there, when we talk about this, sustain. Okay? Uh, most people are very familiar with the word maintain. You know, you keep something up. You do what you've got to do to kind of keep it going, you know, and, uh, you know, keep it in good condition, things like that. Well, when you sustain something, you do whatever it takes to support it so that you can maintain it. You give it sustenance. You nourish it. You do what you have to do to maintain your Christian life. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. Paul says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Now, that's one of the things. That's why the Bible tells us, you know, if you have a problem with another believer, get it done. Get it taken care of. It's very important to do so. Why? We don't war according to the flesh. That shouldn't, that shouldn't be a problem. We shouldn't be having issues. You know, well, you know, Somebody might do something or say something, and you say, well, you know, I'm done. I'm out of here. I ain't going back. I don't think they're doing what's right, blah, 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 whatever the case might be. And people just, you know, they just uh, give in to their sin nature and, and just go off into the sunset. But Paul says in verse 4, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. You see, Satan, the devil, Beelzebub, the evil one, he has fortresses built up all over the world. Yeah, he's got them built up all over the world, all kinds of things to prevent people from believing in Christ, to prevent believers from uh, making righteous practical applications. Fortresses to try and destroy our mental attitude, to rob us of what God's provided for us. But Paul says we are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Well, you know, people can speculate about all kinds of things. Speculation is not necessarily based on facts or the truth. You know, it's what if? What if this happened? Sometimes it's hypotheticals. Sometimes I just don't like hypotheticals at all. What if, what if, what if? You know, we can take that what if and just take it out the door and leave it out there. Yeah. Sometimes hypotheticals can help you analyze where you may have a problem. But the thing about it is if we have the truth, we know the truth, and we're going to apply the truth, we don't need no speculations. All we need is a knowledge of God. What did Satan do as the serpent back in the garden? Did God not say? Hmm? It was a deception. against what they knew about God. Notice that Paul said he's, that we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Every thought captive. 
That means you've got to control your mental attitude. I always like to watch the old cartoons and different things like that where somebody's got to make a decision and you've got this angel pops up on this shoulder and then the devil pops up on the other shoulder. You know, and it's kind of like the devil. Well, that's, that's your sin nature popping up there. And here's the divine viewpoint over here with the angel. You know, you got to decide what you're going to do. Something comes up, you're going to go through a mental process, however quick or however long it takes. But if you hold your thoughts in obedience to Christ, it shouldn't be a problem. I remember years ago I met a young man I worked with, and uh, he was working on a aircraft and on their uh, flight controls and I was working in another section working on another aircraft and flight controls and and uh, he seemed to be a good guy and and uh, anyway he was telling me about how he he just recently he went to this church and he got saved and became a believer and you know was baptized and all this stuff and then I didn't see him for probably about five or six months and then one day there he was. And I going down to this one area to do some work. And I said, hey, how you doing? I hadn't seen you in a long time. And he said, well, he said, I had to go on nights for a while. There's some things came up, you know. And I said, yeah. I said, well, so how's your Christian life going? And he said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, you, you told me you became a believer. You got baptized, all that stuff like that. He says, yeah, yeah. He's, and uh, he says, but, you know, uh, he says, there's, there's all kinds of ways to find God. Oh, no, really? And see, he hadn't learned that he needed to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And he had learned that, well, you know, everybody can find God in a lot of different ways. He'd learned some human viewpoint and doctrines of demons. And I told him, I said, well, you know, the last thing I remember was that there's salvation in no one else other than Jesus Christ. And, of course, he turned away from me. But anyway, there's what we have, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. We destroy speculations. We take every thought captive. There's your procedures in the Christian way of life. This is what you do as a believer. Point A, everything we do begins with our mental attitude. If we are not in line with Bible doctrine, we can be in real trouble. We can be in real trouble. Let's look at Romans 8, 5 through 8. Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 8. This is an operational... Warning. Operational warning. Ops warning. For those who are, according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death. But the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God. For it does not subject itself to the law of God. Doesn't subject itself to divine viewpoint. For it is not even able to do so. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You might simply say, well, this is just talking about being in fellowship or out of fellowship. You see? But here Paul says, for those who are, according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. That's right. It's about mental attitude control. It's an operational warning for believers. He talks about the, the mind set on the flesh, hostile to God. 
doesn't subject itself to God. Why? It's not able to do so. You ever been in a spot where you got out of fellowship and you were so mad? You didn't care nothing about being in fellowship. Hmm? I know it's going to be hard for you to believe. I've been there. Maybe hard for you to believe, but I've been there. Somebody did something to me. But I knew what the Word of God said, and I had to get over it. Had to work through it. Try and reconcile it. And press on. But I mean to tell you, the old flesh took over my mind. If I'd have run with it, it would have been ugly. It would have been ugly. Let's look at Romans 12 too. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. Have you ever noticed that uh, when you're dealing with just the average people in the world, that uh, you know they they try and run with the latest, greatest, current fashion trends and all this kind of stuff, you know? Well, I mean, there's a lot that can be said about that, but uh, you know they control the stuff that that we do in a lot of ways, and in some ways there's nothing we can do about it. People out there, this you know, Satan's got them working on his team, you know, and it's it's we're in a situation now where, uh, you know, when you're dealing with, say, if you were looking to buy another vehicle, a car or whatever like that, well, uh, your big three automakers here in the United States, they've just about eliminated automobiles except for little battery-operated cars. Anything in between that, you can get your SUV or a pickup, whether you like it or not. That's about the way it is. And I hope, I hope the foreign car makers don't follow them. It will be in a world of mess, you know. But you know how they had to do that so that they could uh, get into their electric program so they wouldn't be snowballed by electric car makers. But here we've got something. This is a prohibition in the Greek. And do not be conformed to this world. Yeah. We have a negative and a positive command. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. By the renewing of your mind. The only way we can renew our minds is with Bible doctrine. We can't go down to the library and depend on, you know, looking at Sports Illustrated or Car and Driver or good housekeeping or architectural digest, yeah, it's probably not going to transform our mind in the way that God would have us to. But there's a reason. There's, there's an intended result for this so that you may prove what the will of God is. That's what Paul said. Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind your mental attitude, your thought processes. I tell you years ago, after, you know, partying hard and being on drugs for about seven years, that uh, I needed a renewal of my mind. And uh, thank God that he could do that for me. You know, I didn't, I didn't have much problem with going out and working, but there was other things that I had issues with. And I thought, God help me, because I don't know what to do. So I started reading the Bible. And of course, uh, when we talk about what the will of God is, it is good, acceptable, and perfect. Good, acceptable, and perfect. That's the funny thing, you know, if you went out on the street and he told somebody, okay, here's the will of the devil, and here's the will of God. Which one do you want? What do you think they would say? 
here's one that's good, acceptable, and perfect. And here's this other one that's bad, it's unacceptable, and it's kind of messed up. Which one do you want? Well, most people would probably say, I'll take the good one. I say, well, yeah, but you've got to believe in Jesus Christ. No, I don't think so. I won't take that. Because that's the way it still is. Salvation in no one else. Salvation in no one else. Those are the procedures. Let's stop right there and we'll take about a 15, 20 minute break and come back in here and work on this some more. <laughs>